Welcome to Community City Church, a church where real people like you and me can experience a real God as we do real life together. My name is Edwin, I'm the pastor here, and I'm so glad that you decided to join us today for the online sermon message. We do want to let you know that we are having in-person church services, and we would love for you to join us so that you can grow in your faith by getting connected to deeper spiritual community as we learn to walk with Jesus together and change the world with Him. We meet right at the Fairway School every single Sunday at 150 Cross Street in Malden, Massachusetts at 10 a.m. Come and experience God with us live and in person. And if you are unable to join us, we are so glad that you are here. We hope that today's sermon will encourage and build your faith as you see that God is moving in your life and in your circumstances. Enjoy the message. Would you please join me for our reading of scripture? Today's reading comes from the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 through 33. Please follow along in your own Bible or with the scriptures on the screen. Again, that is Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 through 33. Hear the word of the Lord. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, growing up, I lived in a blended family because my dad got remarried. And so I spent a lot of time getting to know my dad's wife, her kids, and her side of the family. And whenever there were family get-togethers where her side of the family would join us, I remember before the guests came, my dad's wife would say, hey, let's not talk about politics and religion at the dinner table. And it's funny that she said this because my dad loved talking about politics. In fact, my dad was so well informed about his political views that if you happen to have an opposing view, you would end up walking away after a discussion with my dad, questioning your views. So when I asked my dad, hey, how come his wife said not to talk about politics and religion at the table? My dad shared that her side of the family was on the opposite spectrum of the political aisle and so she wanted peace when there was lunch or dinner. However, regardless of what her wishes were, someone would always make some comment about politics or religion and the fire would get started as the table discussions got pretty angry quickly. And when it comes to those two topics, politics and religion, most people have an opinion about what they think and how things need to be. And usually, such discussions can end up in voices raised, swearing, feelings being hurt, and even the ending of relationships. But as a young adult at the time, when all this was happening, I always wondered why those two topics, politics and religion, caused so much tension. And I discovered that the reason why is that whatever you believe when it comes to politics and religion, it really just gives people a glimpse of what your worldview is. And since your worldview is how you see the world, as soon as someone counters what you believe in, even if what you believe in may be wrong, it starts to become personal. And the notion that we should not talk about politics and religion has unfortunately also carried over into the greater church. And this doesn't make any sense because in reality, the church should be the first place 
where we can talk about anything that affects our lives, and this even includes politics. And if the church bears the light of Jesus to a watching world and sets the example of how to love others, then all the more we have to talk about stuff like this. Plus, as followers of Jesus, we believe that God has answers about all the problems, issues, and questions that our culture is asking. And that includes speaking into our political beliefs as well. And since we all know that we are in the midst of a political season, we're beginning a three-part sermon series called God and Politics. What does God have to say about it all? This is necessary because politics can be very divisive and become polarizing and tense for many people, including Christians. So how do we navigate these times like Jesus, especially when we all fall in various places along the political spectrum? Well, if we consider ourselves to be followers of Jesus, then we are actually challenged by Jesus to approach our worldview, our convictions, and even our political beliefs through the lens of our faith in Him rather than create a version of God or faith that supports our worldview, our convictions, and our political beliefs. And usually when it comes to politics, there are three different approaches that most Christians can fall into. The first is to hide or to avoid politics. These are Christians whereby if and when politics come up in the conversation or on the news, they quickly change the subject or the channel as they disengage from the whole political process. So they either don't know what is happening in their world, they don't want to offend anyone, or they believe that understanding politics is not that important. And there's really nothing spiritual about it. They're fine with talking about God and the Bible, but they have trouble talking about what God actually has to say about the problems in the world that they face. The second approach is to obsess over politics. These are the Christians who justify everything they do for the sake of of their political ideologies, views, and convictions. They are frequently glued to the TV as they want to know what is happening and evaluate who said what or who did what. These are the same people that you have on social media who are always posting something about why their candidate or party is good and why the other candidate or party is extremely bad. You will see their threads as they go on rants, giving their opinions or talking about conspiracy theories. Or when they are having a conversation with you, they will ask leading questions to find out where you stand on politics. So they can either hug you in agreement or find ways to argue with you and try to change your thinking. For Christians that fall into this category, Many times, politics just transforms them into a different and self-righteous person who believes that they know it all and that everybody else is wrong. These are also the people who walk around loud and proud where when you look at them, you know exactly who they will be voting for. The third approach is going with what is popular with the culture. These are people who go to church or identify and look like a Christian on the outside. But the reality is that their views on life and politics actually come more from cultural trends rather than from the ways of Jesus. They easily adopt popular opinions and perspectives based on what everyone is talking about or who their favorite actor or artist endorses rather than thinking through such issues through God's word and with God's heart in mind. And since following Jesus is not really a part of their day-to-day -day life and decision-making, it is hard for their faith to have any influence over their political views as well. So when you ask these people what they believe in politically, 
they will often give you views that actually contradict the God that they claim to follow. And of course, there's so many other approaches that Christians have when it comes to politics, but these are just some of the most common. Maybe that is why there is so much division in our country, because there are people who think that their candidate or political party has got it right, and that if you believe otherwise, then you are absolutely wrong. You're people that are full of fear and anxiety, believing that if their candidate of choice doesn't make it to office, then the country and the world will end. Plus, there are just so many issues and there is no way we can agree on all of them. But even in this polarizing political climate, there is a question that followers of Jesus need to wrestle with. Even though you disagree politically with the other person, even if they have a stance that makes your blood boil, even though they state opinions that you think or even know are wrong, the question is, are you still able to love someone unconditionally, even when you disagree with them politically? And for many people, including Christians, the answer is no. Because as soon as you disagree with someone politically, or they have a different view than you do, the argument or the silence happens. You know, I cannot believe that you believe that. Do you realize what kind of person he is? Or do you realize what she hasn't done? Then comes the cancellation of the person with the opposing view. I have seen people who have been friends for years end their friendship over opposing political views. I've seen marriages suffer because spouses can't agree on issues. I've even seen people leave churches because the pastor or some staff member supports an opposing candidate. And the reason why many Christians have such a hard time loving other people unconditionally, including those who disagree with them politically, is because those same people have allowed their politics to influence their faith in Jesus and how they see the world instead of their faith in Jesus being the thing that informs and transforms their politics and how they see the world. So instead of being conformed into the image of Jesus, even with our views, many try to fit God into their image and their agenda as they use God in a way that justifies their political views of what they want to see in the world. And when Christians do that, whew, it is very, very dangerous. When Christians do this, yes, they are very passionate about politics, but the reality is that they often are unable to support their beliefs with what God has to say from Scripture. Or they pull out one or two Bible verses to try and back their claim, even though they are taking those verses completely out of context. Then, when you ask follow-up questions based on their view, they are actually not able to give any sort of substantial biblical answer that supports what they say. And this is very sad because it reveals that most of the views that they have have actually been shaped by culture, media, and other people's opinions rather than being shaped through a Christ-like lens of what God has to say about it. But it is also sad because these people claim to represent God, but yet they can't tell you how their views support what God wants. And whenever we put our politics before our faith, the result is always hurtful and insensitive commentaries or actions said and done to those around us. We can end up becoming prideful and self-righteous as we demean others and as we start to draw lines and force people to now take sides. Or we simply just cancel relationships when we disagree. There is hatred in our speech, in our actions, 
in our social media posts, division in our relationships. And we live in such a way where the world looks at the church and sees no distinction between followers of Jesus and everybody else. We get so fired up and debate on issues because we think we know so much about how things should be and why we are right and why they are wrong. And unfortunately, many of us do it at the expense of the relationships that we have. But I also want to make it clear that if you are not a follower of Jesus and you are listening to this, then you are actually not required to do any of this hard work. Because Jesus is not the one that you are accountable to. However, I invite you to investigate more about who Jesus is and why it is so important to live life with him and filter our views, our convictions, our actions, and our politics through his eyes. Because if Jesus is God, and if God has things to say about everything in our life and in our world, then I encourage you to listen to what this is all about because it will actually change your own life. So what does Jesus have to say when we do find ourselves disagreeing with others, especially when it comes to our political beliefs? Well, Jesus encountered the same thing when he had an interaction with the group of Pharisees that we read about in the New Testament of the Bible. The Pharisees were the religious leaders during the first century, who were all about the observance of the 613 religious laws of God, and they expected others to live exactly like them when it came to their approach to God. And so when Jesus comes onto the scene, the Pharisees would often argue and debate with Jesus because Jesus, who claimed to be God, said that by believing in him, a person would fulfill all of the law. And this enraged the Pharisees, and they would even make accusations that Jesus was crazy because he didn't observe the religious law the way that the Pharisees interpreted the laws to be. So one day, a group of these religious leaders come to Jesus and one of the men from the group who is an expert in the law of God decides to ask Jesus a question to try to trap him and reveal to the whole crowd that's there as to what a fraud Jesus actually is. We pick up the account here when the Pharisees ask Jesus, of all the commandments, which is the most important? So the Pharisee is saying, hey, Jesus, out of all 613 commandments that Jews have to follow, which covers things that pertain to daily life, out of all those commandments, which one is the most important and is above all the rest? The Pharisee is asking this question because he wants to find a loophole in the law. Because if he just obeys the most important law that Jesus talks about and not the rest, the Pharisee can always argue that he is obeying the one law that Jesus says is most important. And if you obey the most important law, then that means that the other laws not mentioned by Jesus are not important. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Jesus quotes the Shema, which is the fundamental set of beliefs of the Jewish faith, and was cited every morning and evening by devout religious Jews. The Shema proclaimed that God was one God, which was different compared to the other nations who believed in many gods. The Shema was said by Jews as a reminder that God was with them and that they were the people of God. And so Jesus continues, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus says that the greatest commandment above all the other commandments is to love God with a whole being 
which means loving God with every aspect of our life, being focused on that love for God. And when Jesus says, with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, he is saying that God must be loved with total obedience and total devotion. And this comes from a total surrender of one's life to him. Jesus is not saying just love God, but he's saying love your God, meaning that our love for God is through a relationship with him. He's not a God that is absent and distant, but a God that is intimate with us. And because of his love for us, our response is to reciprocate that love for him. And many people who follow Jesus wouldn't argue with this. In fact, many would agree and say that they do love God this way. You know, yeah, I love God. I have my quiet time and my prayer time with him. You know, I read scripture and yeah, I know about God. But the thing about this commandment is that it is all internal. Anyone can say that they do this. And there is no way to disprove that you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But when Christians say that they have a relationship with God, and that they want to keep that relationship totally private, saying, you know, my faith in Jesus is just about me and God. You know, I don't need anybody else. Well, then the reality is that they are only living out half of the gospel. That is why people who say that they can have a relationship with Jesus and grow in that faith on their own without any sort of community or accountability, like being a part of the fabric of a local church, well, then the reality is that such people are not actually following Jesus. They are actually creating their own gospel of what is convenient to them when it comes to Jesus. These people may be Christian by name, but definitely not in function. And though the religious leader only asked what the most important commandment was, Jesus didn't stop there, but gave a second commandment. Jesus says, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. See, many of us say that we love God on the inside, but no one can disprove us when we say that because anyone can say that they love God. People can't read your heart and no one can prove that you don't love God. But now Jesus is actually challenging us to love our neighbor as ourself. And this is where things actually start to get complicated because in reality, the real test in how we love God is actually demonstrated in how we love and treat those around us. But unfortunately, people will say that they love God, but they don't do a good job in loving others. Instead of treating people the way that God would treat them, we instead take cues from the culture, from our family of origin, from the media, as we do unto others as they have done unto us. So if you offend me, then I will offend you. If you hurt me, then I will hurt you. If you disagree with me, then I will yell at you and then I will cancel you. And many Christians have done a very poor job when it comes to this, and instead of being a light and a demonstration of Christ to the culture, Christians can easily just do exactly what the culture does. But Jesus says to the crowd listening, and he actually says to us, let me tell you what's most important to God. What's most important is that your love for God that you say that you have on the inside 
needs to be demonstrated to those around you on the outside. You demonstrate your love for God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength by the way that you treat other people. These two commandments are intimately related and they go hand in hand, meaning you can't have one without the other. You can't say that you love God and then go and hate your neighbor by writing rants on social media as to why that person is dumb for believing what they believe. You can't say that you love Jesus, but then hate on people who believe differently than you do. That is why Jesus calls it a commandment, meaning do it. Because when we do follow these two commandments, that Jesus says are the most important, we actually end up fulfilling all the other commandments. And loving your neighbor does not mean just loving those whom you like and agree with or get along with. Your neighbor that Jesus is referring to is everyone, even your enemies, those that get on your nerves, those that you hate, and even those who have differing political views than you. So that means that if we say that we love God, then do you love others the way that you say that you love God? So if you're a Democrat and you say that you love God, then do you love your neighbors like Republicans and conservatives the way God would want you to love them? If you're a Republican and you say that you love God, then do you love Democrats and liberals the way that God would want you to love them? If you're a libertarian, an independent, or some other political affiliation, the same question applies to you. You say that you love God, but do you love those who differ from you the way that God would want you to love them? Now, I'm not saying that when you see such people that you like or even don't like, to excuse their sins of violence, corruption, racism, pride, lying, etc. Because yes, we invite people living in sin to repent as we pray that their hearts are changed. But Jesus is challenging us. I want you to love anyone whom you perceive as being your enemy. And to bring it down to an even more personal level, Jesus is saying, I want you to love that person who posts daily about a view that gets under your skin. I want you to love that person whose views you consider to be nonsensical and absurd. I'm not saying to love their sin or even their behavior that hurts others but to love them because God loves them as much as he loves you. And here's the reality. If we don't love others the way that we say we love God, then it is actually an indication that we don't actually love God the way that we think we do. Because talk is cheap, but action in how we love others is worth a thousand words. Scripture says, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that loving God means also loving all people and not picking and choosing who we want to love based on our convenience. You must do both. In fact, later on in his ministry, Jesus tells his disciples this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And the crowd listening is silent. See, it's easy to love God or say that you love God or put on a show for everyone to see that you love God. 
But if you're frequently argumentative and demeaning of others, if you show obvious hatred and violence towards a particular person or people of a particular party or group or who support a particular candidate, if you dehumanize others in your mind and in your heart and you cancel them, then you want to check your own relationship with God because when we do such things, we in reality are not loving God. Because our love for God should influence our love for others. The account continues when the religious leader says to Jesus, Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. The Pharisees' response to Jesus was right. It's easy to think that religious ceremony and devotion are more important than our love for God and our neighbor. But this isn't the case. Attending church, serving, leading, doing things for God do not mean anything to God if they're not accompanied by acts of love done in his name. Because what Jesus sees as obedience to him are not the sacrifices that we make for him like serving or giving financially, but the love we show him by loving others. And so love God and demonstrate your love for God by how you treat the people around you. And the reality is that this applies to all followers of Jesus in every season that they're in, including in this political season. And here are some tangible ways that we can engage lovingly with others during this political season. Number one, always remember that our first allegiance is to Jesus. Many of us are more passionate in talking about following our political parties rather than talking about following Jesus. Many of us spend so much time trying to engage with others politically, trying to convince them about why our political beliefs are right or why a candidate is so good, but yet we don't spend that same amount of time doing that about Jesus. So if our first allegiance is to Jesus, then why are we more passionate about talking about how politicians are going to fix the world when they still have yet to do so. But yet, we are less passionate in advocating for the things of God and how he wants to bring restoration to this world through the gospel. Rather than watching the news all the time and being consumed by it, looking at pundits' opinions of what is happening, I think God's invitation for us is to actually spend more time getting into God's word to see what he has to say about what is happening and how he may want to use us to bring healing and restoration to this world. Because Jesus is the only one that can ultimately change a person's heart, including our own heart. He's the only one that can ultimately change the world. Our allegiance should never be to a party or person. It should always be towards our Savior and our Lord, Jesus. Next, aim to be a student, not a critic. There was one time I was hanging out with two friends and we were just laughing and talking like we are so used to doing. But then politics came up, which is fine. But this was what took me aback a bit. My two friends were discussing a particular issue. And when one of my friends asked who they were planning to vote for, my other friend told them. And immediately there was silence and a pale look came over the friend who asked the question. And then all of a sudden, that person said, I cannot believe you would vote for that person. Are you stupid? Well, he didn't really say stupid. 
he actually had a whole bunch of swears come out. And after he was done, there was silence and our time together that was initially fun and enjoyable, all of a sudden became really, 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 really awkward. My friend who revealed who he was voting for wanted to have further dialogue. But my other friend shut everything down. All communication was cut off. And one friend was willing to forego a relationship and a friendship because his supposed friend had a view that he felt was absurd. This story demonstrates that how you talk and engage in political discussions, topics, conversations, it matters. Most arguments start with, you got it wrong. Let me tell you what's really right. But as a way to practice loving our neighbors the way that we love God, instead of being a critic that builds walls and destroys relationships, why not be a student that builds bridges with that person? A student is someone who studies, asks questions, and learns so that they can better understand a topic or a person. And such questions are asked not to make a point or not to cross-examine, but to actually understand that person better. This posture allows you to hear people's perspectives and where they are coming from instead of just immediately assuming and then canceling them when, they, when we don't like what we hear. And so here are some questions that we can use when engaging in a conversation with others to help us to be students instead of critics. Hey, please tell me more about why you believe what you believe. So if someone states that they support a candidate, a policy, an issue, or an organization, then ask, hey, tell me why you believe that. The second question you can ask is, hey, how did you come to that conclusion? So whatever belief they may have, well, how did you settle on that? This becomes an opportunity to hear someone's story as you get to dialogue and know them better. Then the third question you can ask is, hey, have you always held this view? This allows you to hear the history of how they came up with the view or the stances that they have. It also allows you to learn about the person's passions and even their hurts. And if they are a follower of Jesus, it is asking, hey, how does your faith in Jesus inform your current view? Asking of these questions can apply to friends, coworkers, family members, and even on social media interactions. Because when you can take time to hear someone's story, someone's perspective, you find that you may have more in common with them than you think. And the hope is that by asking questions first, it eventually becomes a dialogue of understanding and finding common ground versus just coming up with judgments and assumptions. And after learning about the person, you may say, you know, I definitely don't agree, but I can definitely see where you're coming from. Or I may not agree, but I can see what experiences in your life led you to that conclusion. When we do this, even though we may not agree with them politically, we're still able to love them unconditionally. I found that I have made more friends and found more common ground with people who are on polar opposites in beliefs as me than I would have otherwise. Next, know when to speak up and when to be silent. When it comes to engaging in any sort of discussion, we have to be able to discern if it is even wise to initiate or to respond to a conversation. There are people who are argumentative and dogmatic, and as soon as you bring up any sort of opposing view, emotions and temperatures all of a sudden start to rise, and they respond exactly like my friend did to my other friend. They're not willing to hear different perspectives and sometimes will even respond with hurtful words and actions. No, 
that at that point it is okay to disagree and just walk away because it is no longer a healthy conversation of dialogue but has become a toxic exchange where the other person's goal is to hurt and to demean. However, as followers of Jesus, God actually calls us to be salt and light in this world. That means even representing him in all that we say and in all that we do. When we love people well, we gain trust with them, and that gives us the platform to now speak truth into their lives as we point them to the Savior who can actually change them and the world. The unfortunate thing is that when there are injustices in this world, many times followers of Jesus are nowhere to be found or they just remain silent. Which means that when we do see injustice in this world and in the lives of others, we do need to speak up and take actions accordingly as we leverage our faith and stand in the gap for those that are oppressed and marginalized. We need to engage with what is happening in this country and in this world and to use our faith in order to bring hope and reconciliation to this world. We should always use our prophetic voice to stand in the gap for others by using our power, our privilege, our resources, and our vote in order to bring justice and peace. And this includes speaking up even if it's against the party or candidate that we subscribe to. Now, I'm not saying don't vote. In fact, we want to encourage you to go out and vote. But whoever you're voting for, you want to have an objective view of the great things that they may be doing, but also the things that they may be doing that are not right. We need to be able to speak about those things rather than just remain silent and one-sided like many news networks can be who favor a particular candidate. The unfortunate thing is that many people who claim to follow Jesus are so enmeshed with the candidate and political party's agenda that they support and that it makes it very hard for them to speak up if their candidate or party does things that may not be right. Because if we really look at our politics through the eyes of our faith in Christ, then our faith may actually put a barrier between us and the candidate that we claim to support. It may actually put a barrier between us and the agenda of the party that we subscribe to. Of course, there is no perfect candidate. However, in the way that we vote and in the way that we deal with politics, we have to look at things through the lens of what Jesus would say first. And lastly, be wise in how you engage with others. How you engage with others will determine whether you gain a platform of Christ-like influence or you lose it. Jesus knew when to speak and when not to speak. And we need to be wise to know when to engage politically and when not to engage politically. This doesn't mean that you can't have a conversation. It doesn't mean that you can't share your opinions. But know that if you do, you also do risk the fact that if the person that you are talking to doesn't respond in a way that is receptive, it could end up putting a barrier between the two of you and actually prevent them from wanting to hear more about the faith that you have that can ultimately save them. Of course, every case is a case-by-case -case basis. So you need to ask God and have discernment for what is wise and then engage accordingly. You know, we represent Jesus and we are called to love one another, including those that don't look like us, believe like us, think like us, or vote like us. Remember, if we don't love others the way that we say we love God, then that is actually an indication that we don't actually love God the way that we think that we do. 
So may we listen to Jesus' words again. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, help us to be wise when it comes to navigating this tense and polarizing political climate. Whatever views we do have, help us to see it through the lens of you first. And when it comes to relating to others, we pray that our love for you can actually carry over into our relationships and our love for others. God, we want to promote you because you are actually the one that changes lives. You are actually the one that really changes the world and gives everyone hope. You know, as we continue in prayer, many people are turning to politics to meet their inner needs when in reality, politics does an absolutely terrible job of doing this. Politicians suggest that they can do that, that they can change everything, but the reality is that they can't. But God can, and in fact, he will meet all of your needs when you choose to follow him. Maybe you're hearing all this, and you realize that you don't have a relationship with God and that you want one. You want to experience his love and hope. You want to experience his mercy and forgiveness for your sins. And if that is what you want, I want to invite you right now to ask Jesus to come into your life to save you from your sins and to transform you to be the person that you were meant to be. If that is your desire today, then will you pray with me right now saying, Heavenly Father, forgive me for all of my sins. Save me and make me new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can follow you for the rest of my life. Help transform me to be the person that you meant for me to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If you pray to ask Jesus to come to your life, then that means that you now have a relationship with the God of the universe and that you're part of his family. Please email us at info at communitycitychurch.org to let us know of your decision and we would love to get to know you better and give you some resources to help you to grow in our relationship with God. Now, go in peace to love and to serve the Lord.